joining us here today to talk about some different causes and treatment options for low back pain. Um, Elise, our, mar our marketing director, is here today as well. She will be responding to some of the comments and getting questions available um, if any do come up. So please leave them in the comments. If you are watching this after the fact um, and you're not live anymore, please leave those questions in the comments as well and we will do our best to email or respond to you uh, in that manner as well. All right, we're gonna get started here. So today we're gonna be talking about low back pain. Um, it's a very common cause of injury uh, and something that we treat a lot in, in PT. A little bit about Cornerstone Physical Therapy before we get started. Uh, Cornerstone PT is a local PT-owned clinic. We've been here since 2008. In the Asheville area, we have three different clinics. Um, two are presently open right now, our Arden Clinic in South, in South Asheville and our Woodfin Clinic in North Asheville. We are planning to reopen the East Clinic um, later this year as things become more clear after all the COVID. Uh, what we do uh, normally specialize in, the bulk of our patients are for orthopedics. However, we do have some specialty programs that um, are also included in physical therapy. Some of that includes pelvic health therapy, which includes uh, treatment for urinary and fecal incontinence, uh, pregnancy and postpartum care, as well as any pelvic pain. We have uh, TMJ and facial pain as well. So that's um, your jaw joint and anything that happens into the face in terms of Bell's palsy or trigeminal uh, neuralgia. We have a few therapists in our different clinics who also specialize in CrossFit and weightlifting injuries. Uh, so once gyms are open back up again, if that's something that uh, you're having issues with those movements, it's something we can assess and help you with as well. We have a therapist who does lymphedema, which is swelling into the different joints. Sometimes that can occur after surgery or after any sort of uh, cancer treatments and things like that. Our massage therapists have started back, I think, two weeks ago and we started into phase two. Uh, so we have that. Uh, Chloe is our massage therapist available in our South Asheville clinic right now. All right, so that's about cornerstone physical therapy. Now we're going to dive into low back pain. So low, ba low back pain uh, is essentially pain, muscle tension, or stiffness anywhere in the lower back region. Um, it can have a lot of different symptoms associated with it and can last anywhere from a couple days to up to 12 weeks. It does become chronic. Many people, unfortunately, do suffer from back pain for a long period of time, but there's a lot of things that we can do to help reduce that. Some of the incidents and prevalence of low back pain. Unfortunately, about 70% of people, so the vast majority, will experience low back pain at some point during their life. Most pain resolves quickly within two weeks, but unfortunately there are people with persistent symptoms, and some may even be unable to return to work and will go on permanent disability because of low back pain. However, again, the vast majority of people will resolve within a short period of time. To go into some of the anatomy of the low back, you have five vertebrae, L1 to L5, that stands for lumbar, which just means the lower back region, as well as the pelvis and the sacrum. The vertebrae are separated by different intervertebral discs. Um, those essentially act as shock absorbers for the spine, and they help to cushion the movement and allow for proper movement of the spine to allow for twisting, bending, turning, all of those things. In addition, there's ligaments around each joint in the back, as well as muscles that attach to help, to help you move through the back. There are nerves that come out of the spine, kind of from the spinal cord, and then go down to supply and innervate the muscles of the legs. So anything that you're doing with walking, standing, squatting, those nerves that control those muscles will be coming from the back as well. There's multiple different sources of low back pain, and these are kind of the common ones that we'll see. We'll go through each of these individually, and then, um, delve into some of the options that we have to treat them. The first one that we have is nonspecific low back pain, which essentially means that there's not a specific pathology, not a specific uh, result on an image. Um, and this is actually the vast majority of the patients that we do see. Sometimes this can be a diagnosis of exclusion, but also um, this just means that there's some sort of pain in the low back. Uh, you may or may not have imaging associated with it, but this is definitely um, the bulk of where patients lie. 
Another thing that can be that can contribute to low back pain is sciatica. So the sciatic nerve, you have two sciatic nerves in the body, one down your right leg, one down your left leg. It's gonna come out from the back and then branch into two and then go down through the hips and low back in the back of the lower legs. These nerves, or this nerve will essentially innervate a lot of muscle from the back side of the legs down to the calf and the bottom of the feet. So that's a pretty common one that we see as well. Sciatic symptoms um, can include any of the following, whether it's pain, tingling, numbness. Frequently people will report this further down into the calf or feet, but it can also occur in the back of the hamstring or the glute in the bottom area as well. Another common cause of back pain will be a disc issue. So discs can essentially um, herniate in a couple different ways. There can be a protrusion, which is a disc bulge, where essentially that disc that's between each vertebrae pushes out um, and puts more pressure, increased pressure on the nerve as it's exiting out the spinal cord. There can be a protrusion, which is a bulge, an extrusion, where a part of that disc actually becomes, uh, occupies more space in that area, in that hole. And then sometimes it can even be what we call sequestered, which means that that chunk comes off and now is almost free floating in the area. Um, discs, I know people frequently think that once you have a herniated disc, you have it forever and always, but discs will heal just like many of the other ligaments, muscles, and joints in the body. Another cause of back pain or something that falls into this category is SI joint dysfunction. SI stands for sacroiliac, and it is where the sacrum attaches to the hips and the pelvis. Um, this is commonly associated um, with probably more so women than men and frequently associated during pregnancy or um, postpartum timeframes as well. With that, it can also be accompanied by some pelvic floor dysfunction. Uh, SI joint can Joint dysfunction can also occur um, in men and without a history of pregnancy as well, but uh, those populations are more prone to it. Finally, hip pain can frequently mask as back pain, and whenever we do an evaluation for either hip pain or back pain, we will look at the opposite, whether it's hip pain or back pain. Uh, pain in the hip can be in the back of the hip, towards the butt area, or on the outside of the hip, and these joints are so close together and frequently interact to provide stability when we're walking and standing that sometimes the pain that you experience in your back might actually be coming more from the hip. So those are the main areas that we will look at when we look at main causes of back pain. One thing I did want to touch on with back pain is that frequently people have had imaging. They might have started with an x-ray but now going on to an MRI. Those findings that you get are frequently confusing and make, um, can be kind of scary in terms of what's seen in the, in the image and what that means for you clinically. So here are a couple options or a couple things of what it means um, when you see these words on your MRI report. Stenosis stands for a narrowing of the spinal canal, and that's a very normal um, age-related change that happens. Sometimes that can cause pain um, into the back, but also some of those sciatic-type symptoms down the leg. Sometimes it's completely asymptomatic as well. You could get a herniated disc, which we've talked about a little bit as well. And then there's either DDD or DJD, which is either de degenerative disc disease or degenerative joint disease. So those can be two things that can happen as well. Um, excuse me. And then another thing that you might see on the MRI report would be a fusion of the vertebrae that naturally occurs. This can happen in some people and um, doesn't necessarily have uh, significant clinical pain associated with it in all cases. Going into some of the MRI report, um, I think it's really important to touch on that the MRI is not an excellent diagnostic tool in terms of what it means clinically. They've done a lot of studies that look at imaging in an asymptomatic population. So what that means is people who have no pain at all, feel totally great, they go and do imaging, whether it's an x-ray, MRI, and in MRIs, they have found that 37% of people as young as 20 will have disc uh, abnormalities, whether that's disc bulges, protrusions, or just a, a degenerative disc disease. Um, and that 
percentage increases drastically when you get go up in age, increasing to about 96% of 80 year of 80 um, year olds. So that's something that's very common. So we tell you this so you understand that just because an MRI report might say that you have a disc bulge or it might have a disc protrusion, that doesn't necessarily mean that all things are doomed and that's absolutely the cause of the pain that you experience in that area. Frequently, those um, those changes you won't even notice, you won't feel, and it's a very normal part of aging in the spine. So. In PT, we kind of take a lot of that into consideration and in making sure that the MRI lines up with the clinical symptoms that we see. I'm gonna show you next a couple um, examples of some muscle referral patterns. And this is another cause of pain that can frequently mimic some sciatic symptoms or just mimic other pain in the back, knee or hip. So that it's important to kind of differentiate, well, is this truly coming from the joints or is this potentially a cause of um, tight muscles or tension throughout different areas. So these uh, pictures, I know they're a little hard to see, but they will have kind of red dots where it shows common referral patterns. Uh, and this is for one of your glute muscles. That's one on the outside of the hips. And it commonly refers pain that goes down the back of the leg, into the hamstring area, all the way down to the back of the calf. And there's another one that can refer more to the sacrum, into the back of the butt area, as well as down to the sit bones. So that can be caused from some of the joints and the vertebrae as well, or in this situation, it could also be caused from the muscles. Here's an, another referral pattern for the piriformis, which is one of our deep hip rotators that sits in the back underneath the glute muscles, helps to provide stability and support for the hip joint. Multifidi are another muscle that um, help to stabilize each segment of the spine. There's one that runs from the top vertebrae to the bottom vertebrae throughout the entire spine from neck down to your sacrum. And those multifidi can have pain local or it can also refer pain further down uh, towards the sacrum and towards the lower part of the back as well. Your quadratus lumborum is, is another muscle that's affected when we have low back pain. It commonly is called your QL, and it can refer pain uh, right where it's at, which is in the back between the ribs and the top of the hip bone, the hip crest, or sometimes it can refer down lower into the bottom, into the sit bone area. And finally, your psoas is a muscle that um, runs from the spine down to the front of the hip, and it can refer pain into the front of the thigh as well. So the big thing that we want to review with low back pain is kind of what are the things that we can do if you are suffering from low back pain. We kind of break things down into three options, you know, and I'll go through each of those individually. First thing you can do is ignore it, right? Just pretend it doesn't, there, it's not there, and keep doing your daily activities. Or maybe you only get low back pain when you go hiking. So you're saying, you know what, I just won't go hiking. I'll walk in my neighborhood, but nothing going uphill. So I'll just ignore it. The issue is that if we're not addressing the root of what's going on with why you're experiencing that pain, ignoring your pain frequently just serves to get those muscles and areas in the back weaker and more fragile. Bed rest is almost always discouraged and has actually been found to increase pain, increase muscle atrophy, and limit the things that you can do. They've done studies where injured workers who have stopped doing exercise after a back injury actually had longer periods of issue versus those who maybe modified the exercises they were doing but continued to do some sort of activity to help to, uh, to get that back feeling stronger and safer. The next thing you can do is alter it. And there's lots of different options within the medical field of ways to alter the pain, some of which are very good options for the right patients. That, um, there's definitely options that have shown to be effective. Some of that is NSAIDs, something like an ibuprofen or potentially a prescription from your physician as well. Um, exercises has been an effective uh, option for treating low back pain, as well as muscle relaxants occasionally have some use in acute cases where there's a specific trauma to the spine. There are some that are kind of on the fence, likely to be beneficial for the right patients. 
Um, if you do have something called radicular pain, where that pain is going all the way down the leg and potentially getting some weakness, whether that's foot drop or uh, difficulty losing some atrophy, losing muscle mass into the leg, then sometimes a fusion surgery can be a good option. Massage has some benefits to it as well. Um, behavioral therapy is a new thing that uh, is being researched a lot in terms of what are the things in terms of lifestyle changes that can be made. And that has some evidence to support that in the right population, it might be a good option, uh, as well as acupuncture and joint manipulation. So that's something um, that we'll delve into as well. Some of the effectiveness or some of the treatments that we have that we don't we're not sure because there's been mixed results in terms of the effectiveness for chronic pain um, that frequently get overused and over prescribed would be something like local injections that might be an epidural or also a injection of either lidocaine or a steroid injection into the spine. Again, for the right patient, sometimes these have a good option, but for chronic pain, frequently these do not have the same effect that we would like them to have in reducing pain long term. The same goes for some of those lumbar supports, whether it's like a back brace that wraps around your torso or uh, some other treatment options, treatment modalities, such as TENS units, which are those little electrical stimulation units you can use, or traction, which some people are familiar with with those inversion tables. For the right patient, again, they can be useful, but for chronic pain, frequently these interventions do not have the best results. It just alters the sensation that you're feeling versus getting to the root of the problem. So that brings us to our last point, and this is really where physical therapy has a great role to play, is changing the pain that you experience. So rather than just taking medication to not feel it as much or just ignoring the things that you're that's causing pain, uh, changing your pain can really look at long-term solutions for your low back pain. So I wanna kind of go through what that looks like for physical therapy for your low back pain. There's a lot of different options that we have and that we regularly employ throughout your plan of care. The big ones are gonna be hands-on treatments, hands-on care, as well as exercises and patient education. So hands-on care looks like a combination of either soft tissue mobilization, which is more like massage, or there's also different joint mobilizations, which is where the therapist might do passive stretches to the joint to help get those joints to move better, as well as some joint manipulations, which might be a what we call a um, high velocity, low amplitude thrust to get some of those joint manipulations or uh, cracks in the spine. Um, what we also do with hands-on care, is there's another technique that we frequently use called dry needling, where we will use a thin filament needle uh, and stick it directly into some of the tight muscles to help get a trigger point release into that muscle uh, to reduce the tension that they experience and allow patients to move better with less pain. Manipulation, which is that joint mobilizations with exercise, um, has actually been shown to be more effective than treating low back pain with exercises alone. So incorporating some of that hands-on care can be a really nice adjunct to reduce the pain you're experiencing in order for you to move more efficiently and perform the exercises a little bit better. They've also done um, a, a lot of studies where they combine joint, joint uh, mobilizations, myofascial release, as well as patient education on different behavioral changes. And those combine to really be an effective way to help start to tackle the problem of low back pain. To touch on exercise, I do want to go over kind of what our weekly exercise recommendations are. Obviously, when you're in a lot of pain, when you have an acute period of pain, there's things that we're going to have to modify. But reducing exercise and eliminating it completely is not going to be a good option to help you get back to the things you want to be doing. So the American College of Sports Medicine does recommend 150 minutes per week of exercise. So that's looking at about 30 minutes five times per week. They do recommend uh, incorporating some cardio exercises, which can be something like walking, especially up or down hills, running, swimming, biking, anything like that where your heart rate is going, as well as some incorporating strength sessions so that you can um, start to build up the muscle mass to help support not only your back, but your shoulders, your neck, your hips, all those areas. The most important thing that we stress with exercise is that it should be something you enjoy. 
if you pick something that you hate doing every day, you're less likely to do it. So find something that you enjoy, whether it's getting out in the yard and doing yard work or playing with your grandkids or going on a bike ride with your family. There's lots of different options uh, for exercise. You just have to find the right one that seems to fit for you. When you exercise, there's actually a lot of benefits to the body in terms of pain, in addition to some of the things for heart health and weight loss or anything related to that. Your body actually reduces secretes these analgesic substances, so pain-reducing substances, when you exercise. So frequently exercises help to reduce the pain you're experiencing. It helps with the muscles to relax, especially if you've been doing something more sedentary throughout the day, whether that's sitting at a desk, driving a lot. Movement makes us feel better. It's going to exercise going to improve your overall mobility and allow you to move through a greater range of motion and control that as well as some of the mental health aspects. Exercise is gonna reduce depression and, and anxiety uh, and make overall help to improve your mood and help you feel better. I'm gonna show you a couple examples for exercises for low back pain. This is by no means an exhaustive list and also not necessarily appropriate for all patients. However, these are kind of ones that we may or may not start with as we're doing exercises. Um, in physical therapy. This first one is kind of on hands and knees. It's frequently called bird dog, and you're going to be extending one arm and one leg. And the next one is very similar to it, where you're sliding on your stomach, lifting opposite arm and opposite leg. Every time we engage opposite arm and opposite leg, um, what happens is the small spinal stabilizers, the multifidi, have to work to stabilize and support your spine. That way we're not rotating and twisting. Uh, and that those muscles are really important postural stability muscles. So they're going to stay engaged, remain engaged um, when you're doing that uh, rotational movements. This is also really important for walking. When we walk, we will do always one foot forward, normally the opposite arm swing. So it's a very natural pattern to get the um, opposite arm and leg engaged. As well. This is a little hard to see, but kind of working on some different pelvic tilts by moving the pelvis, that's also going to affect how the spine moves, and that can help to give you a little bit more support and stability. We may start with exercises lying down and then work to do those same motions, either, either in a sitting or a standing position, so that it translates more effectively to something like picking your kids up off the ground or being able to get out of the chair without pain. We want to get to more sitting and standing exercises as quickly as possible. Here's another one, kind of working into the muscles of the outside of the hips. I think our next couple ones are also working muscles of the outside of the hips. You have your gluteus maximus, which is the butt muscle that most people know, kind of the big one in the back, but you also have muscles on the sides of your hips that every single time you're standing on one leg, which happens frequently when you're walking, running, um, anything like that, you're going to have to engage the muscles on the outside of the hip. And these exercises help to strengthen it. That way more stress is not going through the spine itself when you're doing those motions. Here's another one that works um, the muscles on the outside of the hips, typically the gluteus medius and minimus. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways to do this, and sometimes we might add a resistance band or an ankle weight to make that more challenging as we go. Here's an exercise known as bridging, where you're lying on your back and lifting your hips up. It's frequently used starting maybe with two legs and then going down to a one-legged bridge as well. So those are kind of some examples of the exercises that we might do. Every single physical therapy um, treatment is going to be catered specifically to you and the impairments that you have. So just because these might work for one patient doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right combination of exercises for you. So that's what we would do with our evaluation is determine where to start. A huge piece that we also do is going to be patient education. So what that might look like is looking at different postures and position. One big thing that we've noticed recently when we've had more people working from home in offices or maybe even just their kitchen table or their couch uh, that's not necessarily designed to be a permanent workspace is we've had to review a lot of how to modify your workspace uh, to be more ergonomic and reduce the pain either into your neck or back. When you are sitting at your computer, you want to make sure that you're, you know, sitting symmetrically. 
two feet on the floor, weight on both of your sit bones. So you're not crossing your legs or rotating your body. You also don't want to have your body turn one way and your head the other. Uh, as best as possible, we also recommend that the monitor is eye level so that you're not constantly looking down. Same thing, you want to have things close to your body whether it's the mouse, the keyboard, all that stuff, so that you're not reaching out in front of you for those things. As well as sitting position, another position that we spend a lot of time in is going to be sleeping position. We recommend sleeping on your side or on your back. Sleeping on your stomach typically is stressful to the low back and the neck. Um, so on your side, it allows you to keep your spine a little more neutral with the head um, in a neutral position, so pillow between the shoulder and the neck, and then potentially a pillow between the legs can help to reduce pain if you are experiencing pain at night. On your back, you will want probably a little bit smaller of a pillow, but still slightly elevated, and some people will find benefit from a pillow under the knees. In addition to the sitting and sleeping position, there's a lot of lifestyle changes that will help to um, reduce the pain you're experiencing, not just in the back, but everywhere else. Uh, nutrition is important as well as uh, avoiding weight gain. I know a lot of gyms are closed right now and people are not able to do some of their normal exercise, but any sort of increased weight gain is gonna put more strain through the spine, the hips, the knees. Some of those big weight bearing joints might have a negative effect with that. And that's something to talk to either your doctor or a dietitian if you have other questions regarding it, the proper nutrition. In addition, sleep is so vital for recovery. If you're not sleeping well, if you're not sleeping enough, your body is not going to recover well. And that goes for everything. You're not going to get over a cold as quickly. You're not going to uh, reduce your back pain as quickly if you're not sleeping well. So that's an important thing to really try to prioritize when you're trying to recover. In addition, some other uh, lifestyle choices such as smoking, that um, can help to reduce blood flow to your spine and to the muscles and joints around the area. So really focusing on uh, smoking cessation, again, talking with your doctor to determine some other options that uh, might aid in that is a good thing as well. So physical therapy kind of will address patient education, exercises, and some of the hands-on care that combined has been shown to be to be effective for treating low back pain. And it's something that we see frequently. And unfortunately, there's always people who have back pain and are not getting treatment for it. And that can cause increased disability and this problem to become more and more chronic and thus harder to treat. So if you are experiencing back pain, um, there's definitely some options that we have for you. One is gonna be coming to the clinic for an evaluation. Evaluations for us are going to be 60 minutes long and that'll be one-on-one -on -one with the therapist where they will do a full evaluation of the back, potentially looking at the hip as well, and any other joints involved. Uh, following that, they'll come up with a treatment plan and discuss it with you. Say, these are the things I found, this is what I think is going on, and this is where we're going to start. They'll also look at different exercises for you to do in the clinic, but also at home to help facilitate your body's healing. We normally provide treatment on day one so that the goal is always for you to walk out of the clinic feeling better than when you came in. So that's typically what an eval and, uh, uh, evaluation looks like. We also have an option to do telehealth visits. This has been changing a little bit throughout the COVID pandemic, depending on what um, your insurance will or will not cover. So if you are interested in potentially a telehealth visit where you would stay home and do a video um, or a different video call to review different exercises, stretches, and go through that, then our billing department can kind of run your insurance benefits to determine if telehealth would be a, an option for you as well. If you are not feeling comfortable coming into the clinic, maybe you're a high-risk patient or just not ready to come out following COVID-19 quarantine, um, you can start with some of the education, the exercises that we described today. If you leave your information in the comments today, Elise can email you the um, exercises that we discussed. And then when you're medically able or when things have calmed down to the point when you feel like you can come in for an evaluation, then we can pursue that. Okay, so at this point, um, 
that's kind of the information that I have for you. If you do have any questions, please, you can reach out to us. Our number is listed on the screen as well. You can talk to Elise. Her email is listed. It is elise at cornerstoneptnc.com, and she can help direct those questions in terms of where they best need to go. Um, if you do have questions about something else besides back pain, you can always give our office a call. Um, we treat a lot of different, con different conditions and can determine what's the best plan to help get you feeling better and back to your normal activities quicker. Alrighty, thank you very much. Come on. And